My mission is to help clinicians around the world integrate longevity into their aesthetic practices. The trend is absolutely towards wellness. The whole world is becoming more and more interested about how to live healthier lives and that starts with your skin and how you feel. Many aesthetic practitioners are already doing this and I'm gonna help you do it faster with a more solid grounding in the science. I'm gonna be building a world-class longevity clinic in this building. We're gonna do everything you already know me for, plus a whole lot more. I'm building a team of clinicians and PhD researchers who are gonna do this work for you, pass it on so that you know exactly how to structure your business so that you can be part of the longevity revolution. Let's start by recapping on what is aging. When you see aging as the accumulation of damage, it becomes much clearer how we could potentially reverse that damage and even slow down the process, which means we could reverse aging and slow down the rate at which we age. This is tremendously exciting because most diseases in Western society are most associated with aging. So simply delaying the process will dramatically reduce the disease burden on society. And of course, really what's valuable is individual people living happier, healthier lives because of the science. So what is the science of aging? Essentially, we have been for many centuries trying to dig down and understand what the process is that causes the loss of function in the human body. Aging is essentially a gradual loss of function and trying to understand the mechanisms behind that empowers us to alter the inputs and the system itself to delay or slow that process. So in the study of understanding the human body and particularly at a cellular level, how it ages and how that process generates changes that are associated with aging, it empowers us to take control of that mechanism and actually reverse the process. The human body, ultimately, when you break it down, is a computer. There is coding that controls the actions of cells. There's communication from the DNA code to the functioning human body, which is gradually lost. As we understand the exact precise mechanism of that loss, we can start to reverse it and protect that mechanism, which is where the new revolution is going to come from. So how can you be biologically 18, aged 50? So this all boils down to the definition of aging. I think it's confusing to talk about biological aging because it includes aging, which is a chronological term. If I was to refer to it as biological damage, then you could see why you could be 18 in terms of biological damage instead of 50, and it becomes less contentious. Ultimately, it's about what we do to protect the cellular function and the physiological function of bodies. There are many healthy 50-year-old men who can perform athletically close to what an 18-year-old can do. This would be one way of saying they are biologically younger. They are, of course, chronologically not younger, which is where the confusion starts. Do not think of biological aging as chronological in any way at all, and it will make it a lot easier to understand why it's possible. So what are the, some of the markers that you might say are associated with being biologically younger? It could be as simple as your VO2 max. The amount of oxygen that your body can use per minute is one of the most closely associated variables with health and longevity. So if you have a 50 year old man who can utilize oxygen at the rate of the average 18 year old, you could make the claim that they are biologically the same. But VO2 max is only one variable and you could look at that same individual and analyze the amount of epigenetic changes happening on their cells and you may come up with a different number. So a lot of anti-aging science is about trying to get to something really fundamental as the root cause of aging and try and control that variable with a knock-on effect on all the other things that measure biological age. What that means from our position as clinicians is that we need to be guiding patients with the right inputs to make the biggest change for the least amount of effort. And this is something we'll be covering in detail on this channel as we go forward. If you're wondering what epigenetics are, it's essentially the system by which genes are controlled and expressed or turned off. So your body is always saying, produce more of that or less of that in each individual cell. And it does that through the epigenome. When you go through stress, you turn on certain genes. And when you are in a different state, you may turn them off while other genes come on. That system is the epigenome. And as you get older, it gets worse at doing its job. So what about the inverse? What if you are biologically 70, but chronologically 50? This is a very disheartening thing that does happen to patients when you do epigenetic testing. They will find a number that clashes painfully with their identity and their actual chronological age. So what is causing patients to be older than their actual age? Once again, it's important to go back to what biological aging is, which is accumulated damage. So the real question is what has been damaging their cells so that they are not functioning as they would 
for the average person of their age. And there are many inputs that can do this. And our job as clinicians is to help patients understand how the day-to-day -day activities are impacting biological damage, how they can then also reverse that, but how to stop doing those behaviors. The most important of which is probably a lack of exercise. So exercise is a process that actually stimulates cells to behave younger once they recover. For most of your patients, they will associate exercise with an unpleasant process that they just don't really want to do and then it somehow burns up a few calories and makes them slimmer. But that's not what exercise is. Exercise is actually a process that is considered hormetic. That means it does actually cause an initial amount of light damage that then stimulates cells to get stronger and healthier. So you're actually renewing the cellular function of your cells by stimulating them through exercise. It's the actual stress imposed on cells that wakes them up and makes them stronger and younger and clears out some of the damage to the epigenome. One of the big shifts we need to create for our patients is this shift in understanding about what exercise is and what diet is in terms of health because we understand it incorrectly. And that means we are often less motivated to do it. It's a great analogy to think of yourself while exercising as renewing your body because it does produce the enzymes and the processes that will actually help your cells behave like younger cells, repairing and removing damage to the cells and then functioning more youthfully. Something that my family is currently going through is perimenopause. My wife, Miranda, has shared her story on her Instagram, and it's been an eye-opening experience for me to see what actually happens as your hormone levels drop for a woman. These changes are something we all learn about at medical school, but if you don't live with them, you do not realize the severity of the impact. Some of the biggest changes are associated with cell function that shifts as your hormone levels change. Almost every cell in the female body will have hormone receptors to estrogen, and this is why such a wide-ranging effect happens as your estrogen levels drop. There's a drop in how you process sugar. There's a drop in how your brain functions. Even the dilation of blood vessels within your brain can change. Many women will report brain fog, for example. This is actually indicating a decrease in the ability of the cells in the brain to process energy. They do not have enough energy to do the normal function, and this produces a decrease in function cognitively experienced as brain fog. It's incredibly important that women understand this and don't put it down to some sort of psychological weakness. I know Miranda, when she was going through this, kept saying this, am I going mad to people because she didn't feel like anyone understood. And in my research to find out what was actually happening in her brain, it helped all of us have a much clearer and better understanding of why this problem is so important what it could actually feel like, and also how important it is to try and solve it. So how does menopause age you? Well, every cell in your body is stimulated by estrogen. So if I take, for example, the effect of estrogen on your skin, estrogen directly stimulates the fibroblasts that produce your skin. So your collagen, your elastin is made by these cells that live in your skin. And when the estrogen levels drop, they slow down. So your normal rate of production of the connective tissue that actually makes your skin will decrease. You will also get a decrease in blood flow to the skin because those cells are less metabolically active. So you end up with cells that are functioning at a much lower level, attracting less blood flow to the area, and you start to see that on the surface of the skin. Skin turnover will slow down. Even hair growth will slow down. The translucency of your skin will decrease as you get a thicker layer of non-functioning skin cells on the top with less blood flow seen through the surface of the skin. If you picture a baby and what their skin looks like, it is glowing and juicy. There is moisture, there is transitions, it's reflective. If you picture a much older patient, it becomes dull and thicker and it lacks some of those normal transitions. It loses some of its color and warmth and essentially it looks grayer and less functioning because that's exactly what is happening. Literally, there are fewer skin cells behaving like skin in an older person. And one reason for this is because of the stimulation of those cells by hormones. And this is why it can be extremely impactful to replace hormones to enable skin cells to behave more as they once would. So what about weight gain? Being overweight in the Western world is considered almost a normal part of aging. And one of the reasons that it happens more as you get older is simply less activity, but also some of the hormone changes that we go through. But is weight gain itself a dangerous problem? 
Well, interestingly, particularly visceral fat may have a direct impact on some of the causes of aging. Most importantly, we get increasingly insulin resistance as you get older. Insulin, the hormone that allows sugar to enter the cells, it will eventually cause blood sugar to rise. Blood sugar triggers inflammation. If blood sugar runs high, it will cause inflammation in the small vessels of your body. This causes end organ damage to your kidneys, eyes, brain, liver. Everything eventually will function less well due to inflammation caused by blood sugars which are out of the normal range. So obesity is strongly associated with many of the Western illnesses that we suffer. And one of the reasons for this is because of an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines produced by fat. You can think of this a little bit like a car that with a blocked air filter. If it's not getting enough oxygen in to supply the fuel, it only partially burns fuel, leaving more fuel in the exhaust system that is potentially inflammatory. The less clean the combustion, the more reactive species are left. And this happens in a similar way in your cells because they are stretched and require more than the body can provide comfortably, we get an increase in toxins essentially being produced in the process. These oxygen species and these inflammatory cytokines cause damage to surrounding cells, exacerbating the aging process for surrounding cells, which is why we get an increase in cancer and other inflammatory related diseases in lots of people who are overweight. Some of these inflammatory markers are actually measurable. So you can measure in your patients, for example, CRP, and that will tell you to a degree how much inflammation is in the system. There are other very important cytokines we'll cover in future episodes, such as interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. These markers are closely associated with the damage that we're trying to avoid. So what is the problem with these molecules? It's important to remember that there's nothing wrong with inflammation per se if it is in the correct place at the right time. The problem is dysfunctional inflammation, that is chronic persistent inflammation with a lack of an underlying cause other than aging. Many of these inflammatory markers are designed to be there to help us respond to insults such as infection. So if they are being applied appropriately, they are good for our health. The problem is with obesity that you start to get a chronic release of inflammation. And this means you have chronically active immune function that actually degrades many of the functions of normal healthy cells, accelerating the aging process. So what do we need to do to age more slowly or even reverse some of that accumulated cell damage? This is a question I will be answering in extreme detail on this channel over the coming years. So make sure you follow. But we're going to start with a high level overview before we cover each of these topics in lots more detail. The first thing is make sure you control your weight. For me, I think this correlates a lot to choosing what you eat more than it actually correlates to exercise. Or of course, both are important. I'm not a big believer in willpower. I think the key to eating healthily in a sustainable way is to choose foods that are able to keep you fuller for longer. If you choose a diet that requires you to feel hungry for hours or days on end in order for it to be successful, you will find that nearly everyone fails eventually. So we need to change the food that you're eating so that you feel fuller for longer. It involves avoiding simple carbohydrates, which may give you satisfaction, but don't keep you feeling full and increasing the amount of protein that we eat. Protein is one of the best ways to decrease the amount of food that you eat because it is probably one of the better triggers at telling your body when you're full. It's actually quite hard to eat too much protein. Many of the people who enjoy going to the gym to try and build muscle will find that eating the desired amount of protein is one of the hardest things for them to do because they feel full so much more easily. This is not the case with simple carbohydrates where we can eat huge amounts of sugars without feeling full. In fact, they even make you feel hungrier as your blood sugar drops. So selecting your food is probably one of the more powerful ways to decrease your rate of aging. The next way that you may be able to improve cellular functioning and therefore improve cellular aging is to have periods of time where you don't eat. So having spaces in your day where there is no new calorie coming into your body will force your cells to behave differently. It's actually a way of training your mitochondria to be more efficient. Being in a calorie deficit forces your cells to go into different modes of action. So autophagy, the process of breaking down partially damaged or useless cell organelles that no longer function optimally and even old cells can help clear out the cells that cause inflammation and allow your cells to function more healthily. There's actually a really easy way that you can improve your rate of aging, which is to sleep better. So sleep is much more than many people think of it. It's not simply a state of resting. 
there is actually a whole load of biological processes that are triggered while asleep that trigger cellular repair and improve the function of your cells the next day. In fact, while you're asleep, your body will secrete hormones that trigger many of these functions. To take just one example, melatonin. Melatonin is secreted during deep sleep and it actually is a powerful antioxidant. It's a trigger for the biological cascade that causes much of the regenerative processes of sleep, but it's directly associated with decreasing the action of reactive oxygen species because it is such a powerful antioxidant. So this is happening every time you are in deep sleep. Other hormones are also released while you're asleep. So your sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, are also released primarily during sleep. We also have the decrease in one of the hormones that causes inflammation or associated with inflammation, which is cortisol. So your cortisol levels will drop. So stress levels should be lower. And this will allow for regeneration. IGF-1 is also released. This interleukin growth factor is associated with cellular regeneration and repair. There's a whole lot more to sleep, which we'll cover in future episodes. If you want to learn more about this topic, make sure you follow. We're going on a big, exciting adventure to learn everything we can about longevity and help you apply it in your clinics. And if you're a patient, then of course you can learn with us.